Welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is 11 12 21, which uh, is an interesting uh, assortment of numbers in that order. But uh, I'll leave it to the uh, numerologist to figure out what impact it's having on the market and everything else. Let's find out what the real world is doing and inflation. Uh, Michael Pento and I, Pento Port. Dot com. That's where you find him. Michael, we have been laughing at this notion, you and I, on numerous occasions of transitory inflation, a totally focus group driven, focus group created term that has no bearing in reality whatsoever. I just read yesterday that the average Thanksgiving uh, dinner last year, which was the lowest in decades, because we had some deflation in food prices over the past 10 years, was $47.80. Now, I don't know what they're feeding them, whether it's turkey, spam. I don't know what's in that dinner. But now they're saying the turkey alone this year could be over $100 for 10 people. <laughs> but it's all transitory, right? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the program, Kerry. I love coming on your show. Um, could you actually let me expound a little bit on my, my, uh, my thesis? So first of all, let me just comment on the Federal Reserve since you brought them up. Uh, this is the most feckless and odious organization ever known to man. I, I mean, it, it's just so incredible how stupid they are, but they're dangerous too. They are extremely dangerous. You know, do you remember in the wake of the great financial crisis, that they kept on telling us, you have to get to 2% inflation. You must get to 2% inflation. If we don't have 2% inflation, the economy doesn't function well. Well, what they did is they kept on printing money and handing it to banks. And so what did banks do? Well, they bought stocks, bonds, and real estate. So all of the inflation, and we had rampant runaway inflation, but it was all on asset prices. So then fast forward to 2020 and a serendipity occurred. And I say serendipity, unexpected good fortune, because the central bank was able to finally launch the experiment that they had been dying to try for so long, which is what? Universal basic income and modern monetary theory. What if we could actually have the treasury borrow a whole bunch of money, hand it directly to consumers, and we'll print it all here at the Federal Reserve with our counterfeiting machines? <laughs> well, guess what? It worked perfectly. They got consumer price inflation up to where asset price inflation was rising, but it didn't just stop at their, their asinine 2% target rate. It's now well above 6%, which is three times as fast as they wanted it to go. So the idea, I just am I'm flabbergasted at the idea that anyone gives any credence to this feckless um, organization, that they have any clue what causes inflation or how to stop it or what they are doing to the middle class of this country. Hey, so you probably remember this McDonald's commercial back from the 80s, <clears throat> the late 70s. So we're close in the same age range. And this little kid says, daddy, what's inflation? And he says, son, that's when the price of everything goes up and your daddy's pay stays the same. And a little simplification, but I guess the uh, Fed chair missed that uh, that commercial. But that's what we're having now. We're having 70s inflation. I keep harping on this theme, Michael. Most people alive today were not alive during the last bout of inflation that we had. And that inflation was global in scope. We even had countries like Israel having hyperinflation. So I don't know that we're headed for hyperinflation. Uh, will they will they go so far as to crash the currency? And does it matter if everybody else is hyperinflating yeah. as well? well? Well, hyperinflation only comes from a currency collapse. So you know, so that, that's why it's always almost always manifest in banana republics. You need a currency collapse to do it. So if you know the U.S. dollar index is mostly measured against the euro and the yen and the pound, well, they're doing the same darn thing that we're doing. So it's hard to get a currency collapse. Uh, but you could have a Roman-like situation where, hey, you know, Roman didn't have an actively traded denarii, but guess what? They had a thousand percent inflation. So you can get a, a very high level of inflation, hyperinflation, 
in a currency in a in a in a country that only has one main world reserve status. But that you know that's down the road. We have other problems coming in 2022. I want to get into that. So, but let me just let me just comment that next year I see this whole thing melting down, and um, I, I think that we're having a fiscal and monetary cliff heading into in 2022 in the second quarter, like we have never seen before in this country. And inflation is going to slowly pull down. It's you know, on a second derivative basis. So instead of rising at, if you measured it pre Boskin commission, you know, it would be close to 14%. It's going to come down to maybe 4% annualized uh, growth uh, in 2022. So it will be coming down. But what's really going to happen is you're going to have a crash in asset prices because you see a global tightening of fiscal and monetary policies concurrently. And that could, and that's what I'm monitoring in my IDEC model, inflation, deflation, economic cycle model. I am monitoring that closely because what you could see is a massive crash in real estate, bonds that are outside of treasuries, you know, junk bonds, corporate bonds, even investment grade bonds, and um, even municipals to a lesser extent. And that could cause inflation to crash all at once. Mm. And in that case, well, the because their main concern is that the stock market doesn't go down because then they can present this illusion that every of normalcy that uh, we're prospering, et cetera. At that point, does the stock just does the Fed just go right into the stock market and start buying stocks to prevent a crash? Yeah, exposed, exposed. That's why we. That's why I think we're going to become Rome in 2023, 2024. So here, here's the, the conundrum for the Fed. So remember the Fed was telling us for decades, they did this Phillips curve analysis of inflation. They said inflation comes from what? Too many people working. Well, yeah. now Jerome Powell is faced with the conundrum here. He just learned that inflation year over year is running at 6.2%. 6.2% percent year over year, the way they measure it, which takes out, you know, it's hedonics, it's, it's substitution. They just, you know, bastardize the whole measurement, as you know. Um, but 6.2 is a lot higher than two. And then he said, well, we're not going to raise interest rates yet because what? Not enough people are in the workforce. Oh, okay. So the light bulb should be going off with you and your audience. Say, wait a second. You just told me for decades that a very low unemployment rate is the very progenitor of inflation. And now you're saying what? That you want more people working and the unemployment rate to fall? So you want inflation to wax higher or, or, or you're repudiating everything the Fed has told us for decades, which one is it? Hey. But I, wanted, I just want to comment on, the, on what I think is happening in next year. Mm -hmm. You know, we're already going to have, we have the most, and this is why I think we're having a, we're going to have a, the chance of a violent crash in asset prices, and that would bring about deflation next year. So earnings growth on the S&P 500 this year, 2021, will be about 45%, which is an incredible growth rate year over year. The next year, that growth rate, and this is not according to Penta Portfolio Strategies, this is according to FactSet and Forbes, it's going to crash to the single digits. So you're already going to have a, a trenchant, significant plunge in the growth rate of earnings, which normally would bring down that PE ratio. But then on top of that, you have a very persistent virus. COVID-19 is not going away, um, unfortunately. Uh, you have the expiration of $6 trillion. In the, last, in the previous two years, 2020, 2021, $6 trillion was handed out to people to boost consumption, directly to consumers and businesses, Carrie. And most of that was monetized by the Fed. That's going to almost zero in 2022. The Fed has taken its balance sheet to $8.5 trillion, $4 trillion, over $4 trillion increase in the past two years. By June of next year, the increase in the balance sheet will be zero. So you couple that with higher taxes, which are coming from the Biden administration, higher interest rates, which are already here, higher inflation, which we've already just talked about, and the COVID cases. And you add all that to the fiscal and monetary cliff, and you have the, the chances of 
the stock market absolutely crumbling. Now, I think it's going to happen in, the mat in, a, in a matter of a month or two. That's, that's the, the truncated duration of this crash. It's going to look a lot like we saw in 2018 and in 2020. But here's why it might not just stop at 30%. We have already jumped the shark on inflation. Inflation is already a problem. In other words, consumers have already believed that they are their, their faith in the dollar's purchasing power and the faith in our treasuries has already been shaken. What if Mr. Powell comes back in the middle of this deflationary asset price crash and says, okay, we are now going to print trillions upon trillions of dollars hmm. and, and send, then the Senate and the House get together and also launch another universal basic income project multiple trillions of dollars. Well, what's going to happen to interest rates? I don't think they're going to stay quiescent. So the stock market might collapse because rates are becoming intractable, rising and their, their nature will be rising intractably. So that's another issue that I'm, that I'm worried about because 2022 is going to look nothing like the previous two years. I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, we're just seeing... It's just none of the markets are really functioning because I guess when you have free unlimited liquidity, there's no limit to where the markets can go. And like you say, we had asset price inflation. Go back to what Milton Friedman said, inflation first and foremost is a monetary phenomena, which means it's not as a result of shortages because if there's a shortage, if prices go up in one area, then prices will go down in another because there's a fixed amount of uh, spending power out there. So let's face it, they can say it's because there's uh, prices went up because too many people are employed, prices went down because not enough are employed, but that really is the tail wagging the dog here. Absolutely correct. You're 100% correct. And you see that evident in the monetary base. That's the high powered money, which, which is the basis of building lots of all other money, all the other aggregates, M1, M2, and M3. It's exploded from $800 billion in 2008, the beginning of 2008, to eight and a half trillion dollars. I mean, if that doesn't, if that doesn't destroy, I mean, eventually it had to do it, Kerry. It destroyed yeah. the confidence in the purchasing power of our currency. And if we're not careful, it's gonna destroy the confidence in our sovereign bond market. You know, you look at debt today, Kerry, we're at seven, the debt of the United States, $29 trillion. That's 725% of our revenue. I, I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible that anybody believes we can ever pay this debt off. We just can't do it. I mean, if you had a mortgage that was 725% of your income, and nobody, first of all, nobody would give it to you because they know you can't pay it off. So um, we have a, 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 an adjustable rate, a variable rate on our interest payments to our debt. We can never inflate our way out of this problem that's been, that's been tried over and over again throughout history. Inflation does not work. And if we're not careful, you know, you have 6% inflation and you have, you know, 10% nominal GDP. Um, what do you think the 10-year note really should be in reality if all these central banks ended their interest rate repression? Well, I don't know what it would be, Kerry, but it wouldn't be one and a half percent. That's the danger. You yeah. can see a spike. You could see a spike in interest rates, and what that does to the real estate market, the junk bond market, which, by the way, a record amount of issuance with junk bonds. Um, it, you know, it it would wipe out the real estate market, the investment grade corporate bond market, the junk graded bond market. Mm -hmm. It would wipe out the stock market and the real estate market too, all in tandem. Hey, it's kind of like a neutron bomb. It'll leave all the buildings standing, but it'll kill off all the people. Hey, so real estate, perfect example of price inflation. And you're talking about our relative uh, house hunting experiences here, where prices are at. Uh, but is the Fed really just going to turn off the money spigot and let all these markets collapse? Because they're faced with a conundrum. Either the currency collapses or the asset markets collapse. And, you know, uh, my son is really uh, kind of cynical. I don't know where he gets it from, but he <laughs> says you can always count on people to do the wrong thing. <laughs> well, so first of all, like I told you, the Fed is feckless and, and, and mostly ignorant and competent and dangerous. So they don't think, maybe they, maybe they, maybe, I don't know if they really believe this, but they're telling us to believe 
that tapering asset purchases is not the same as tightening. Well, I mean, that that is complete bunk. And that was just you know, completely proven false. Sure. In 2018, 2019. Yes. If you go from a, if you go, if the Fed goes from printing $120 billion each and every month and handing it to Wall Street to gamble with in the junk bond market, um, what's going to happen when they go to zero? There, there's huge problems that are going to happen. But I mean, the, listen, Jerome Powell has no choice. He's got, he cannot, he can no longer ignore the fact that you have a car company like Rivian coming out, going IPO. They sold 150 cars in their history, mm -hmm. electric vehicle maker. And in one day, their IPO is greater than the entire market cap of Ford. This is the kind of systemic risk they're creating. And you can look at cryptocurrencies too. Uh, and I don't want to get into this big discussion about them, whether they're, they're, they're worthwhile or not. I think they have little or no utility, but they're vying to become, uh, you know, Wall Street darlings and they're succeeding in, in, in many instances. Of course, when you become a Wall Street darling and you become something that's no longer decentralized, you become a centralized currency, you have no, no utility. There's no use for it. The only thing that these, you know, you have a 64 private, 64 bit, letters and numbers electronic as it's called the private key if that private key is something you have to share with somebody because you know what everybody when you be when you buy a bitcoin from coinbase or you're from an etf you know you there's kyc laws there's no your customer laws in wall street sure. you know exactly who you are and they can take that bitcoin from you at any time they want and they want to so you know if bitcoin can be sixty four thousand dollars a unit well why can't gold be you know two thousand dollars an ounce. Um, so, uh, but that's also another, this is a manifestation of this massive bubble that we see created directly at the feet of the Federal Reserve. Rivian, cryptocurrencies, they are all systemic ris risks now. The stock market is the biggest systemic risk, along with the bond market and the real estate market. And they have to address this. Otherwise, inflation is going to wax intractable. But if they address it, they're going to bring us into a deflationary depression. So there is no choice about it. The stock market will crash either through runaway inflation or through a de deflationary depression. And it's my job as a money manager to figure out which direction they're going to take and then appropriately position your assets accordingly. Hey, so here's the question. Is there a way for an investor? Okay, let's put precious metals aside because okay, there's no counterparty risk. And if everything deflates, in theory, at least, the purchasing power of precious metals should increase of gold and silver. But uh, short of uh, buying uh, precious metals, is there any way to uh, yeah. for Joe Sixpack to, to insulate himself or Jane, uh, Jane Sixpack or uh, Steve Chardonnay uh, even? What did they do? <laughs> We well, have to be, you know, while the Fed, the, while the Fed is dithering, trying to normalize uh, interest rates and, and bring um, some normalcy to inflation, you have to be politically correct now. You know, you have, you know, the Fed is dithering, raising rates instead of worrying about how, what's the color of the next person going to be hired on the FOMC? How many females do we have? How many minorities do we have? Which is, I'm all for diversity. It's great. But should that be your primary, con you know, your primary concentration? Shouldn't it be what you've done to this currency, what you've done to the middle class? The real purchasing power of consumers is being destroyed while they're worrying about whether we should hire Lael Brainerd or keep Jerome Powell as Fed chair. Yeah, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Hey, by the way, do you know the uh, definition of diversity? Uh, the definition of diversity is celebrating our differences while pretending to ignore them. <laughs> so that's diversity for you. And Listen, you know, I hear I'm, this. I'm all for diversity, Kerry. How about we hire somebody at FOMC that actually believes in a gold standard? <laughs> that's real yeah. diversity. They tried that once and the person was laughed out of the, uh, the echo chair. Yeah, well, even worse. Uh, that's never going to happen. We know that the only way they go back to any type of fixed uh, money supply is at the barrel of a gun, literally. It's just not going to happen otherwise. So we're in this mess. You can't own real estate. You can't own stocks. Stocks yeah, could conceivably go up a lot 
before this inevitability occurs though, right? Okay, so here's how this plays out. You asked the question before, I didn't answer it appropriately. So there's, I call the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse. And, and the gold is, as you correctly pointed out, there'll be a time, I think gold's gonna go up in the early part of 2022, but there'll be a time when we hit this deflationary depression slash recession, where I, even gold is, is dumped. Everything gets dumped for four things. You need the dollar. People want dollars. When you have no liquidity, you sell what you can to get dollars. You have to short the stock market. You have to own long-term treasury. Uh, I'm sorry. You have to own short-term, short-duration treasuries. And you should own yeah. high levels of cash. So if you, have, if you have cash, the dollar, shorts, and short-duration treasuries, you will probably actually make money during this deflationary depression. But please understand on the other side of that, when the Fed and Treasury once again join uh, hands, and by the way, let me parenthetic parenthetically add that if we adopt, and I think this is gonna happen, if we adopt something called a Fed coin, a, a blockchain-based currency, the Treasury is out of the picture. The Fed can actually fund your wallet directly, which is where I think we're headed on the other end of this deflationary depression. So the Treasury right now has to borrow money and hand it to people. That's what they, that's what universal basic income is all about. And then the Fed prints the money and hands it to the Treasury so they can send it to people electronically. It goes into their bank account. But if there's a Fed coin, you don't even need the Treasury. The Fed could just say, here's your wallet, here's your digital wallet, and here's your money. And we will track everything you buy and sell with it. And we will take your interest rate as negative as we want so you can spend it and get that velocity going. That's where we're headed. And you had better not own dollars and you had better own gold in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So some, some core holding of precious metals, I've been a firm believer in it always, although we've been kind of laughed at the past 10 years. But one thing I wanted to talk to you about, Michael, is recently uh, gold and silver, they're behaving, I'll just put it this way, they're behaving differently, right? They're totally different. They'll go up $20, $30 in a day. We've seen this multiple days over the past two, three weeks. And, uh, and then there'll be a crash day it looked like today was going to be such a day where it was down, uh, you know, double digits, and now it's down 40 cents. So something has changed in these markets. Am I wrong? No, you're not. You're not wrong. And I believe it's because and I sold I sold most of my gold in August of 2020. I have a 4% position now in the portfolio and taken relatively recently in a, in a minor and in physical gold. Um, so other than the 5% that I think everybody should have in their physical possession of your net worth, we are about 4% in the portfolio. But I think gold is, tr is starting to sniff out something, and that is that real interest rates aren't going to go much higher. They're not going to go much higher. Okay. But, you, know, you, know, you Look around the world. You know, these central banks are ending QE, and they're kind of threatening to raise interest rates. But you know, the, the Bank of England just said, oh, you know, we get, they got cold feet when it came to... <laughs> To raising their their uh, interest rates, um, the ECB is miles away. Forget about Japan; they're not they're thinking about you know yeah. and <laughs> going yeah, into more, more more QE. Um, so that's the reason for the 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 the, the uh, relative dollar strength that we are long in the portfolio right now. Um, but I think gold sniffing out that hey, given the amount of debt that you have accrued, especially it was already. At a, at a rate that was unsustainable, a level unsustainable prior to the breakout of COVID-19. And all the additional debt that's been taken on since then, which is mind boggling. I mean, go look it up, how much more corporate debt, how much more national debt we have since COVID broke out. Uh, they understand that higher nominal rates are impossible to, to uh, unten it's an untenable uh, proposition. Mm -hmm. So I think that gold will have a very good Q1 of 2022 outside of that liquidity trap that I see coming. If it comes, it's going to be bad for everything except for those four things I mentioned. Um, and then you want to pile into the gold. And remember, please, Carrie, that gold and silver shouldn't be mentioned in the same breath, in my humble opinion. Silver is semi-precious and it's an industrial. Yeah. It's more of a commodity. Gold is money. 
So gold is going to trade much more towards the level of real interest rates. And then you throw all the base metals and silver. Silver is less a bit of a base metal, but you can throw them all into a commodity basket, much more volatile and much more geared towards global growth accelerating, which is not going to be the case in 2023. So gold is the primary uh, winner in that, uh, in that scenario. All right. Well, what you're saying makes uh, complete and total sense. Uh, I've kind of been, you know, a, uh, I guess a Pandora here. Well, uh, Cassandra rather, I get those two, uh, mythical uh, Greek figures confused, but I, uh, a Pandora too, because, uh, we've opened Pandora's box and a world of trouble is coming ahead of us and, uh, being a Cassandra warning that the sky is falling. Well, you know, the, uh, Benjamin Graham always had a, uh, expression that the tree does not grow to the sky, but unfortunately we're living in times where the tree has grown to the sky and the sky is falling. Well, let me exculpate you a little bit. I mean, you're not a Cassandra and neither am I. I mean, you were dead on right in 2000, dead on right in 2008, right as rain in 2018, 2019 had another repo crisis, 2020 was a crisis. So we've had big corrections. The key is not to always be on a short, you know, on, on the short side of the market. There are times to be short the market. There are times to ride the bubble higher, which is what we are doing now in the IDEC portfolio. But we have, you know, we have one eye, maybe two eyes on the emergency exit. We're ready to sprint for that exit once the music stops. And when it stops, the cascade lower is going to be, you know, so violent, it's going to shake the American and global economy to its core. Hey, and I you know, one thing we, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about China because they've been portrayed as, uh, you know, basically they're going to save the world, the Chinese economy, all this. Uh, I look at their real estate collapse there, the never grand, because it never was grand, but, uh, but everyone thought it was. And I say, oh, my goodness, it's, exa it's un unraveling exactly the way our subprime unraveled in uh, in 07 it's exactly the same here michael are, are we the only ones that see this because it doesn't appear that the uh, chinese government is going to come to the rescue although there's debate about that right but well, when they going i mean emperor for life xi jinping yeah. um, understands that he can no longer keep this asset fixed asset bubble growing i mean 70 percent of chinese wealth is in these edifices that they're building, 20% uh, of which are empty. There's no demand for these, these homes. So build, you know, easing monetary policy by the People's Bank of China and printing more money and having people construct more empty buildings, is it just can't be an answer. But here's the big takeaway I have. I'm sure Xi Jinping will try to ring fence the problem and maybe he's successful to some degree. Um, here's the main takeaway, and you got it right on, Kerry. China saved the global economy in a great, to a great extent in 2008 from the great financial crisis by going on this massive construction pro project, fixed asset bubble, you know, airports, bro roads, bridges, tunnels, empty buildings, uh, you, know, you name it, they built it. Huge de demand globally for commodities. They can't do that again. So no one country, especially China, which is the second largest economy on earth, will be able to save us from what's happening in 2022. It's going to be the I call it the grand reconciliation of asset prices. Hey, such so, a great you, know, you know, home prices in in Naples, Florida, won't go up eighty percent in a few months. That's that's going to be over. They're going to crash. You know, and I know we're running out of time, but just think about real estate for a second. Home price to income ratios at are an all time record high. If you have owned real estate over the past few years, especially in some of these hot markets, you've doubled or tripled your money. And many of the people that I know, the circle of friends I have, have, have many multiple houses are, in, are involved in the flipping of homes, Carrie, again. We're flipping houses again. Yeah. Exactly. What's going to happen? What is going to happen when the money supply, the, the amount of new money dries up, when the, when the new money creation goes to zero, the stock market plunges 30% or more, which is the source of funds for a lot of these purchases. 
and the shadow banking system and the banking system stops making loans to purchase houses. Do you think that Mr. Jones or Sally Jones, to be politically correct, who owns five houses with you know, 10% down, not zero like it was in 2008, but 10% down and has doubled their money in their houses and they, have, they start falling, do you think these people will start listing them for sale? 100% correct. That's the bubble I see creating and how it's gonna burst in real estate. And it's gonna burst in real estate just as junk bond yields skyrocket as their prices crash. At the same time, the stock market crashes and it'll all happen together. And the Fed will have no clue why or how it happened or more importantly, how to fix it. Yeah, more importantly, for sure. And I, I just, uh, I, if you want to look at something interesting, go into YouTube and search the term tofu dreg or tofu dregs. That's the, uh, that is the uh, listing of uh, substandard Chinese uh, construction. And there are hundreds, maybe thousands of videos showing these things falling apart, showing them uh, turning into nothing. It's an amazing thing. We'll put it in the show notes here. Tofu dreg. Michael, pleasure. We got we to gotta wrap up, but uh, go over to pentoport.com. Talk to Michael. Get some advice because you need to be prepared for what's coming down. Like I said, I'm not a Cassandra here. All of this is extremely predictable and expectable, and you can prepare for it. If you got a question for Michael, please, please send me an email to kl at kerryletz.com. Michael, always a pleasure. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks so much, Carrie.